Okay, so very quickly, what is natural intelligence? What is artificial intelligence? A uh, very simple definition is a natural intelligence is all the beautiful intelligence that we see in this created world. And uh, we see how you know humans we function, how do how do insects and bugs, when we observe the world, we see that there's some beauty in the way they function. And that's just what I define as natural intelligence. And artificial is that which we as humans actually spend a lot of time creating. And there is a lot of a lot of new tools that are out here today that uh, that are present. Um, and uh, one more thing is why should we care about this? Um, intelligence, or you know, as we know it in the Vedic parlance, buddhi has many parallels that we can draw between our Vedic literatures and what's there in our modern scientific studies. I believe that it can be a beautiful bidirectional flow. It kind of enhances our understanding of Vedic shastras. At the same time, we can actually pull concepts from our Vedic literatures to actually uh, enhance or improve our own current academic understanding of what intelligence itself is and provide potentially good frameworks for actually understanding what intelligence is and what consciousness is potentially. Um, and why should we care about it? So I know I've see, I see uh, I know around 85 to 90 people attending, attending the session. So uh, clearly we know AI is on the rise. You know, it's a toolkit that's almost become ubiquitous. Uh, across every day and uh, it's like similar to the dot-com burst of the early 2000s right now 2020 see everyone using a profound uh, like profoundly AI based tools so I think it's important to understand what AI is all about and how they are different from today's natural intelligence that we see around us the, uh, and also uh, I, I know there's a lot of news about robots potentially becoming conscious I'd like to provide a framework to how to think about this problem and also share my opinion my personal opinions and uh, on how, if this claim is even appropriate or not. So I'm going to quickly move through this. So one of the things is um, intelligence itself is actually a very important topic in the academic circles. It's actually considered one of the top 18 mathematical problems of the century. And uh, this was uh, a list that was actually composed by a very well-known fields medalist or a Nobel laureate in math, basically, uh, Stephen Smale. And I think... Um, the Vedic texts have a lot of amazing things to actually share to actually enhance our understanding on this uh, topic. Uh, the way I've always thought about this, even during my PhD, was I would take biological systems with natural intelligence and I'd compare them with today's AI systems and I'd try to see if there are gaps or what could be the gaps or what are the differences between the two systems. So let me give you a quick rundown of, you know, this is circa 2021. So we had AlphaGo, a very amazing uh, AI system that was built to actually play the game of Go. Uh, Go is like another strategy game like chess. And uh, it actually defeats. So AlphaGo is a machine that defeated the uh, Go world champion, Lee Sedol, and it made big news, right? So I believe these systems today are superhuman. They can become better than like our world champion. So I know Deep Blue at some point in 1990s actually defeated Gary Kasparov. So you're seeing these systems uh, kind of become better and better over time and better probably than humans. But I believe they still lack certain principles. And let me get to what those principles of natural intelligence are. Um, so another thing is, you know, we've been very, in uh, on, the, on the tech side, we've been very good at scaling these systems. So uh, the human brain uh, is considered to be like the pinnacle of intelligence. That's because the human brain has a billion neurons and a trillion synaptic connections. So you see the orange line that I've plotted here, it's basically uh, 10 power 15, which means a trillion, around a trillion connections, which signifies the size of our, uh, the size of the human brain to a certain extent. And you see, as we go from 1950s to all the way to late 2020s or even 2024, we see our systems that we've built like artificially have slowly scaled, you know? We started with like small hundred parameter systems, which were like, way different from the brain and then we said we'll we and we reached 2020s we start seeing like billion billion parameter systems or even you know 100 billion parameter systems um let me push this here okay so and one of the one of the things that also is like uh, i would say leading the revolution here is the things called transformers so when we think of transformers because some people think of this but i'm talking about you know these these architectures i'm sure the cs people in this community would appreciate um, or you have all probably used these systems on a day to day. Um, and I just wanted to say, like, everyone's heard of Chat GPT. So, Chat GPT is uh, the system that has close to 175 billion parameters. So, it's getting there, it's getting closer and closer to the size of that human brain. Um, so, I, I'd like to 
like do a quick, I know we have time, little time, but let me show you a quick demo of how chat GPT is. I'm sure uh, quite a few have already like played around with these, with these tools, but I thought it'd be fun to just see them together for those who may have not had the opportunity of doing so. Um, okay. So, so I could do something like this. Like I can ask this question, how are you doing today? And it's like, it starts answering in pretty, uh, you know, um, it, it, it pretty well. And then you ask something that, so if, if it asked me anything interesting going on, like, yeah, it's been a fun day so far. I'm trying to demo your abilities on a large Zoom event. Are you ready to stun us? And uh, great. So uh, it's asking me to do this thing. So, um, and then it asked me, what are you showcasing on your Zoom event? And uh, I say this. Uh, so I'm presenting that although AI systems like yourself are very human-like, you're still not human. Do you agree? And uh, and you know, well, it agrees that uh, it's not human-like, and it agrees that you know it can only simulate human-like responses, and it says that we lack true consciousness, which is interesting. Uh, again, to have these AI systems speak in this manner, and uh, given that you know we'll finally again retest it and say, can you crack a joke? Because I can't see my audience, so I don't even know if there's a smirk or there's a smile in their on their face. But let's see if they can if if this can at least. Uh, this is a very classic joke that it always makes up, but why don't scientists trust Adam? Because they make up everything. Anyways, uh, so getting back to our presentation, right? So we have um, chat, like, you know, systems like ChatGPT seem pretty magical. They're like, wow, I can actually start chatting with these agents. And uh, they actually give me very intelligent responses. Uh, and they actually help me on a lot of different tasks. So the question naturally is, okay, it seems like we've been able to build intelligent systems that maybe surpass us. And uh, I'd love, you know, I mean, of course, we might, if when time permits, we, I would love to like get more feedback from the audience on like what prompts or questions they'd like to ask ChatGPT. But on that note, I'd like to also think, what, how do these systems remain different from humans? Uh, so it comes down to like, what are those principles of natural intelligence that are currently absent in today's AI systems? One is, um, this is like, a, you need a large amount of training data for actually training these AI systems. And I'll give you an example of what, uh, you know, chat GPT's kind of systems require. So when you go and read their papers, uh, we know that uh, they've trained on a lot of text. So the entire Wikipedia corpus, so everyone's, you know, familiar with Wikipedia, it is just 0.1% of their training data. What does that even mean? So I pulled up, you know, a Wikipedia article. Of course, everyone's heard of CrowdStrike since yesterday's debacle. Um, and, you know, Wikipedia itself has up to 61 million web pages. Uh, so that's just 0.1% of their entire training data. So a chat GPT-like system has actually seen, has been trained on 61 billion such web pages. Now, just to put things in context, right? Uh, to, to speak intelligently and to speak eloquently, these systems need to be trained on a huge amount of data. Whereas on the, on the sharp contrast, we see humans like you know kids or adults, I'm sure none of us have read 61 billion web pages in our entire lifetime. So clearly there is something that's amiss, like what's going on, what's different between, how are we able to learn so quickly? How are we able to like, you know, uh, how if you see kids, they like they see maybe once or twice something and they're like already picking things up. What's what's different about them? How are, how is uh, either how is our brain wiring different or what else is actually important to learn quickly? So I think this is a important feature that's very different between our today's AI systems, the way we build them and and natural intelligence systems. Uh, also, this is this intelligence is not this you know this quick learning is not only limited to humans. It's actually a, it's it's a feature of our of our world. Like uh, some things that like I've I've spent some time reading about like mud wasps. So they the, they call mud daubers or mud wasps. And the beautiful thing about them is they actually create these intricate nests. And what's amazing about them is. Um, this is their life cycle, right? So a wasp comes, it's like, let's say you have a nest and the wasp comes inside the nest, it goes inside and lays an egg. And you know, it then afterwards the child is born within the nest. The child's born within the nest, the mother keeps you know flying into the nest, feeding, giving it all the food that it needs and you know, nourishing it and all of that. And after a few weeks that the child is like, you know, ready, it's come kind of become, uh, you know, it's able to fly. So it moves, it kind of grows, comes out of the nest. And 
almost instantaneously, researchers have found that it starts creating another nest. So the question is, you know, they've prob they've they've not taken a like you know a civil engineering course on how to create create these beautiful intricate nests. Where is this knowledge coming from? Where is this intelligence coming from? So how are they like how are they so quickly either learning or how are they just like downloaded with all of this beautiful knowledge on how to create these nests? So these are open questions. And you know, at this point, we have no concrete, tangible answers for them. Of course, our Vedic texts suggest some very interesting alternatives of how to think about this. But we still, uh, in our scientific parlance, we are still yet to, uh, you know, understand what's the source of that knowledge and where does it come from. Uh, for for context, and these are these wasps that I'm that are that, I, that you're seeing on you know, panel A. They actually create these nests. One, you know, and this is like nest creation kind of a process. So it starts building these small combs and then afterwards it makes these intricate holes and a lot of beautiful architecture around it. Um, okay, so let's move to the next principle. Um, it, next principle is, yeah, so another thing that's amazing is, you know, um, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone would have heard this even uh, hearing it in uh, in, in, in Prabhupada's books or in his lectures, it's like, you know, Einstein had a, is, a, is an intelligent person, if, definitely, but he didn't create his own brain, right? His brain basically came from, you know, biological processes and uh, there were, other, and, you know, we have a lot of other things that actually go into, uh, like, that basically went into even having his brain. So the question is growth and self-organization of neural architecture. And if you see uh, chat GPT-like systems to build this, these systems, it takes a huge amount of human capital and a lot of GPU computation, which translates to millions of dollars for actually building such artificial systems. But when you look at our brains or you know any insect brains, they just come from a process of self-organization and they come from a process of like uh, not just self, like self-organization is like the, I would say, one part of the whole puzzle. There's a lot of other processes that just so-called quote unquote happen you know, in a very uh, in a very natural fashion, and that doesn't require a lot of uh, I would say um, that, that it it's not it it doesn't it's not like there's a huge amount of human endeavor that's that goes into actually creating these uh, intelligent systems like our human brain or, for instance, our entire body. So, question is, where does all of this intelligence for actually you know creating creating either not just the brain but the entire body from like from a single cell? Where does that intelligence come from? Um, whereas because we don't have such, I would say, parallels in our uh, in our artificial intelligence world, where we can just like you know maybe drop a seed and suddenly you have a chat GPT like system come from scratch. We need a lot of hand hand tuning and tweaking for actually building these architectures and systems. Um, I'd like to maybe uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to show this small video very quickly. Um, you, I, I won't be able to show the entire video; it's six minutes long, but. Uh, what I'd want to point out is definitely go check this out. Uh, they've so here just to give you context, researchers have actually um, they've they've tried to study how a single zygote, which is you know the first cell, basically uh, slowly grows and matures over time uh, to become this beautiful tadpole with a functioning heart, with a functioning set of neurons, and uh, you know the intelligence to actually go and you know function in the in 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 the real world. And they've captured this over a, it's a, I, I believe it's over a ten to twelve hours, and they've they've made a quick time lapse. So let's see if we can see this. So it starts okay, great. Um, so it starts off here. It starts with a single cell, and the single cell breaks into multiple cells. And uh, yeah, here you go. You have four cells now, and eight. And as you grow, and so this is the phase of you know in in embryology. I'm sure many of you have have seen embryology so you'd have you know, the different phases in the you know, generation of an organism um, and that's when it starts making these in uh, I would say these invaginations into the system and and that is and then and then you start seeing some kind of structure start slowly emerging I'm gonna move forward and yes so that's where actually so you start seeing the tadpole slowly kind of uh, you see the, the 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 longitudinal structure that starts emerging from here, and uh, you've not you've the eyes and the heart haven't. So you start seeing a part of the like I would say a different circulatory systems coming into picture. Then the pigments have already come here now, and now you have the eyes as well that have developed. Um, yeah, and 
I, I, there was somewhere there were, in in this video they had also a beautiful beating heart that they show, and and all of these this is like you know this is they have translucent blood basically so this is like how our, how cells within the system actually keep moving around and so that's another part that actually is uh, is all of these systems kind of come into picture yes here's the heart that's pumping so basically with so the point here I'm trying to make is it's stunning to see how development kind of happens and how um, not just intelligence but conscious and like where does the origin of a conscious entity begin and these are open questions in the scientific parlance and of course Vedic literature has a lot of amazing um, insight to provide for actually uh, working on these um, all right moving on another last example that I'll take for before I end this uh, end my uh, presentation is you know there's this flexibility of the mind uh, and one thing is, you know, when we think as like if we if we were to like take some time out and actually just like sit and see how our thoughts basically move, that's something that's beautiful because there is a lot of associative, uh, I would say, learning and associative uh, movement of uh, of thoughts in our um, that that we perceive. So, for instance, a very common example could be, you know, going to uh, like say a store, uh, closed store, and you and, like. If you had a childlike experience of going to a store and you know maybe uh, drink, uh, drinking a beverage, then you'd probably see a bunch of other uh, other uh, I would say food items close by, and that that memory would basically start you know it the beverage itself would 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 force you to recall some other memories. So the question is how does the mind or how does the mind first of all store all of these, and where do you actually how do you actually traverse or traverse this I would say sequence of thoughts. And um, to work on this, there is um, another thing, is not, in addition to just like traversing these sequence of thoughts, we'd also want to model the subjective experience of the experiencer uh, while they, you know, while they recall these things, because there are certain things like, for instance, ice cream, it's going to be sweet, you're going to like, you have a, 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 you know, you have a subjective feeling of how much you like it. And maybe for some of you, it might be karela is something or a bitter guard is something that you know you don't like at all. So there are these these differences that we can uh, that we can that we have uh, as subjective feelings. And up until today, like you know, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of phenomenal work in the modeling of the mind that's happened in academic sciences. But the subjective part of this is not at all captured typically. And I think uh, this to to capture the subjective part and also then bring mathematics to it. Uh, some of the work that, uh, you know, Kunal and Shrey, uh, both of them at IIT Kanpur, have worked on with the BIHS has is, is been fantastic. So they've actually built models where they're trying to understand, hey, here's the experience. Sir. And you have all of these objects like the ice cream, the cookie, and, you know, uh, could be other kinds of foods. And then each object has its own set of, I would say, emotions, taste, shape, temperature. All of these are the attributes of this object itself. And this is how we store information about our world. And this is the like this is a project where we're trying to model a, 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 a make I would say a preliminary model of the mind. And this would actually help us start traversing this particular uh, you know, sequence of thoughts and sequence of objects in this space. Um, with this, I'd like to uh, quickly end with this. But last point I wanted to say was. Uh, again, switching back to the question that I posed earlier, like, hey, can robots ever become conscious? And today we don't, in scientific parlance, we don't have a good framework to actually even ask and answer this question because we've conflated consciousness with the mind, with the intelligence. So if ChatGPT does really well on responding to my questions, I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to say, yes, it's conscious. But no, uh, our Vedic texts have actually suggested a very interesting way to actually divide uh, you know, how to think about this question. So they say, hey, there are many, many layers to this. So there's the, you know, the Pancha Mahabhut, the earth, water, fire, air, ether. These are the first, the more the, the base ground. Then you have mind, you have intelligence. Over that, you have ego. It's like the I-ness, right? Or, and then afterwards, over that is the entity, the experiencer itself. So today's digital AI systems, I believe, yes, they have earth, water. Yep, they are made of, you know, actual bare metal. They are GPU-based. So yes. Then there's mind, yes, to a certain extent, because, you know, you have a mind, uh, the definition of the mind is basically to accept or reject. So, you know, you can actually ask these systems and they'll probably reject and accept certain uh, certain propositions. Intelligence, yes, I believe so, because 
again, intelligence is like, can you now recently there's work on like self introspection and in AI systems where you can actually make them kind of like introspect on their answers and then get back to you. So yeah, you could say intelligence probably exists. Ego, maybe not. Like there is a company called character.ai and they build these systems, these, these AI avatars with like specific, I would say, uh, personality. So you can speak to uh, ent like these AI assistants with perf like with some personality. Like I would say uh, you want to speak to, let's say, um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on, like, say, Harry Potter, for instance. You can have an AI assistant that knows everything about Harry Potter and thinks and speaks like Harry Potter, speaks like a pirate. So those things can be potentially even modeled within the, within the system. Uh, but it's not yet the best place. So I, that's why that's when I said said it's not yet. I I think you know within a few years we will actually probably uh, maybe even perfect that art consciousness or what consciousness itself is. I believe today my opinion is of course that digital AI systems do not have consciousness, and that's again um, uh, that's this this again the, this is a big debate and a big topic to be talked about. But I believe if we think of it in these rungs, we would we could probably better understand whether these systems can ever have. Uh, consciousness or not. Uh, without getting into further details, uh, here's where I end. And thank you so much for all your time. And uh, I, of course, I, I don't know if you have time for questions, but uh, I'm happy to answer those. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer them on the- yeah, There like, are a few interesting questions actually in the Q&A box. Firstly, thank you very much for that uh, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, while you. we switch to the next speaker, maybe we'll just take one which might be somewhat relevant. There, Again, as I said, there are a few. Feel free to answer them uh, by typing them up in the Q&A box later. But uh, will AI have an impact on spirituality in the future? We'll just take this one question while we switch the speaker. Yes, and Rita, please um, video and start. Yeah, so the way, uh, that's a really good question. Thank you for uh, that, that question. Uh, so the way I've thought about uh, everything, uh, like I, I'm, I'm going to, again, like based on what I, my understanding of, of spirituality itself is, we can use every tool for in in for and to help progress our understanding of our who we are and who you know Paramatma is and who Krishna is and and I would say improve our uh, progress in in our spiritual uh, direction. One thing is there, um, so like how computation or how compute like for instance, uh, our source of knowledge right now is um, like the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavatam for understanding what spiritual truths are there. And if we didn't have a printing press, we would actually not have access to that information. If we didn't have the internet, we would probably not have access to that information. So I believe AI also will basically be a very useful tool to actually provide uh, all of this information to and like more in our fingertips. One thing I'd like to also point out is I know there is a group at uh, Silicon Valley who's actually working on a really cool project to help um, devotees and like just members of people who are interested in spiritual sciences to actually quickly like you know use a chat GPT like experience to actually quickly get answers for their deep questions and I think this is a very important thing because you know information retrieval or quick and smart information retrieval especially in you know for spiritual texts because we is is something that will be very valuable in the in the near future so I think it will definitely aid our understanding very much um, Fantastic. And with this... Uh...